Deputy Chief Kyle Rendell and Assistant Chief Alex Ridings. Uh, they're very interested in the process and uh, I'm happy to say I have a really great group of officers this year that <clears throat> are very engaged. So things have been going well with the fire department. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, just going over some statistics and talking a little bit about what we do and uh, what we face. Um, and then uh, it'll relate specifically to the operate, some of the operating budget items um, that we requested more fun money for, specifically maintenance of apparatus. And um, <clears throat> I'm looking at capital, one of the biggest requests we have is replacing um, one of our pieces of apparatus. So uh, if you look at the incidents for 2013, we responded to 619 total incidents. Uh, and to date, um, the extra months included in 2014 were up to 689 uh, total incidents. And we estimate that we'll probably go over about 900 this year. And they break down from service calls to uh, assisting with rescue calls. Um, our biggest piece of the puzzle is responding to alarm activations. And to date, we've had 65 fires. Um, some of the, of course, the notable ones are the ones we hear about in the news with, you know, the, the fire at the cupcake business, uh, house fire on Baird Lane. Um, but we respond to a lot of other different incidents. Um, Thursday, we actually had two fires in town. One was a gas main that was hit, and it burnt up uh, the machine that they were um, cutting a trench with. And it was, it was in a neighborhood with some homes. And then we had a um, fire at the university where someone left a box on a stove and in moving things around, turned the stove on, which caught the box on fire. So, you know, there's different level of incidents we respond to, but um, we've been, we've had a pretty consistent response and good response um, to the calls that we face. Um, a little bit about the amount of volunteer hours that we put in. Uh, so to date, we've put in pretty much over 100,000 hours. The breakdown is uh, member hours committed to incidents is just over 90,000. And training hours are just over about 9,000. So uh, it's a big commitment. And I know you all understand that and appreciate what we do. Um, and... The other piece of information I want to talk a little bit about is, um, you know, ongoing repairs to our building. We do, you know, we have our building there. I know there's uh, plans in the, the uh, pipeline to um, uh, upgrade it, but, you know, we do, recently we had uh, the concrete in front of the bays collapse in one of them, so DPW is working on that fix. Um, and we all, it was a trench drain in front of the uh, apparatus door. Um, and also, we're going to need to replace some heaters in the bays, bays pretty soon as they're aging. So some, some of the things coming down the, um, the uh, line as far as operating. Uh, besides replacing the apparatus, um, you know, we've taken a, a hard look at what we have equipment-wise and try to and utilize what we have. But in the vein of... Um, kind of standardization for firefighter safety. You know, we want to look at doing things like we have defibrillators on our apparatus. They're different from everything in the town. So we want to come in line with, you know, making sure we have the same thing as the police department and the rescue squad so everybody, you know, can interact with them and it's not something different. Um, things like nozzles. Uh, now that we're all consolidated with our response into one firehouse, you know, we would like to standardize that type of equipment. So no matter what piece of apparatus you're on, you're picking up the same nozzle and there's no difference uh, between, you know, pieces of apparatus. Right now there's different nozzles and uh, different equipment on the apparatus. So those are some of the things we're, you know, we're looking to do moving forward. Um, and then, of course, with replacing a new apparatus, we'll shift some things from the old piece over to it equipment-wise, but obviously we'll need... Um, other other equipment to put on that. Um, 
some of the other equipment we're doing rescue wise uh, I believe it was two or three weeks ago we had a person disregard the police barricades and get themselves stuck in uh, water in their car so a joint effort with the rescue squad fire department members and rescue squads suited up and went in and you know thankfully walked this gentleman out safely um, from the predicament he got himself into um, so those are some of the other equipment things we'll be looking to uh, you know purchase and to utilize questions from council well, thank you Bob great um, as you know we're this year hopefully we'll have funds um, uh, set aside to study the firehouse um, in regard to um, renovating or expansion um, or which direction that will go so that has been on the radar and we have been working um, you know, trying to to work with with the fire department. We know that um, we combined um, one department in, with three departments into one, and we know that's more um, more people power. And we know we have um, the the apparatus things that we use. We know that we need space for. And and you mentioned sta standardization, but also we're mindful of of safety um, also. So we are here to to support our fire department. And we also know that it's a volunteer fire department, and you guys do a great job, um, an extremely great job. Um, I was sent, I sent around about a couple of months ago a fire tax. <laughs> if, you had, if you had to pay a fire tax, how much, how much that costs? It costs a fortune to, to, fund, to fund fire departments, and I think that the town owe, owes it to you guys, um, guys and women, and to do the best that we, that we can for you. So we are here uh, to support you. Um, and it's funny because uh, Councilwoman um, Butler recently, as of today, I think today or yesterday, asked in regard to the fire department. So still in all of our minds, uh, you know, which direction we're going and, and how we're going to help you guys. So thank you. Oh, I was just wondering about, I'm sorry if I missed it, no? about how many fires, uh, like, do you have a, a, a yearly report of how many fires, actual building fires there are? Uh, yes, so to date from 2013 to the end of March in 2014, uh, we responded to 65, actually 68 fires, which would be considered dwelling fires. And like I said, they vary from, you know, you get there and the house is consumed by flames to a room in contents, which is one room, to somebody leaving a pot on the stove and forgetting that they had it on the stove, um, electrical equipment failing. So there's a lot of different variations of uh, the different type of incidents we respond to that are considered dwelling fires. And how's the um, alarm, false alarm, you know, problem? Is, has that been worse or better? Um, <clears throat> Alarm activations are uh, interesting. Uh, of course, fire alarms are there for early warning. Um, and one of the things I'd like to try to do a better job of capturing is, you know, how many early warnings do we get where there's actually a s smoke condition, something going on where it alerted us we got there and we're able to stop it before it got any, any worse. Um, it, in respect to false alarms, our fire bureau uh, responds to all fire alarms uh, and they do a real good job of keeping um, that under control by making sure that they you know use the code to enforce repairs and maintenance to the different systems out there uh, when you know when in fact it's a false alarm or a malfunction of the system I just remember seeing a statistic of the number of false alarms and I don't have and it was staggering. I don't know if that's still the case, or if you have that number off the top of your head. Well, we, right, so we uh, report, responded to uh, 336 uh, what are alarm activations. Do you have a report that you gave us that, that I don't, that we lost? Or, I mean, because <laughs> I, I can't. Not recently, I have oh, okay. one. Okay, because you're I, looking at a paper, I thought maybe right. it was your report. No, no, just some notes for myself. Oh, okay, thanks. So, so 336 alarms? Right. 
false alarms? I think all of us up here would appreciate a, a written report summarizing the statistics that you were talking about. That's Yeah, I can do that. And I can um, work with Bill to try to break down the alarm responses we have to actually what was something, you know, smoke condition or something, an alarm activated to a malfunctioning system. Uh, just a, a one further question, Bob. We seem to have equipment stored in both the Chestnut Street and Harrison Street stations. Uh, is that equipment used when we have an alarm, or is that? Yep. So what's how to go with Harrison Street first? Um, in Harrison Street, uh, actual hook and ladder fire company has a uh, antique fire truck that they're working on putting back together. The other thing that's stored there is the um, rescue squad's boat, their rescue boat that we keep there that we utilize. Um, at Chestnut Street, we keep things like um, spare speedy dry uh, and things like that for hazmat calls. And the fire police also keep their equipment there. They have uh, cones, um, the horses, the block roads, signage things of that nature that they store, flares, all that type of stuff. And um, the other thing that there is there is engine 602, one of our out of service apparatus that we no, no longer utilize. Thank you. If I could just make one comment on the uh, vehicle that's in the capital budget for this year. Um, fire department used to have probably the best replacement plan. We stuck to it come heck or high water uh, because of the planning that's needed um, in which to go out there you know you don't typically go out and buy a run-of-the-mill fire truck you know you go down the street so they're a little more specialized the equipment um, we've held off on that for a long time uh, Bob has put together another vehicle replacement plan and just like some of the other things that kind of got delayed through consolidation they went even an extra couple years in waiting for um, this vehicle so that is something that we need to get back on track this year um, because there what you don't want to do is get yourself in a position where you're looking at uh, a series of half a million dollar pieces of equipment um, that are going to come on back-to-back -back, uh, rotations um, so we have the new plan I know Bob's also got some grant funding out there looking at a future piece of equipment and so forth but that's something that we really need to reckon with um, and moving forward this year because that fleet also is aging um, and reliability is critical. Uh, you'll also see, I think, in this budget that the, the maintenance costs for the apparatus, uh, you know, continue to rise. There's only so much we can do in-house with that type of equipment, so we rely, you know, on people coming in to do the maintenance or driving the vehicle somewhere else to have the maintenance done. So just want to emphasize the importance of that uh, equipment in this year's budget. And the number that Lance um, was talking about for the building um, is two hundred eighty thousand dollars if I re recall and you know on my little calendar that's something that I think we need to start to get moving on in that June time frame because we need to put together a proposal to get out um, talk to some vendors get them in and then begin that um, that process of looking at what the needs are um, for the fire department so we can get that uh, kind of rolling I have one more question. Um, and what about the tr truck I remember hearing that um, every day a truck goes from somewhere to the university and then back again. Oh. Can you talk about that? So we have um, engine 601 is actually located at 306 Alexander Street at the university. And it's utilized by the um, associate members. So the university has, I think, somewhere in the, um, 33 to 34 members of the fire department now that respond in the daytime. So we keep that piece of apparatus there. And but during the day, not right during working hours no, or it's is it there around the clock around the clock right. okay and is it outside have, or is it in, in no they have it housed inside they have it housed yeah. inside and we have access to it if we were to need it during the evening hours there's a knox box on the building with a prox card to open up the bay door so we could take it okay thank you bob thank you um i just Quite wanted to uh from the public. Oh no, I just wanted to thank the council for their support. Um, I think it's important for the public to know that we have a council that uh, supports emergency services and um, have supported me 
with all the planning efforts we've been going through. So thank you. Uh, Kip Cherry, 24 Dempsey. Um, in connection with uh, what, what has just been presented, I wanted to make just a couple comments. First of all, about PFARs, um, which, um, y you know, I think uh, those of us who have toured the facility knows that they need some new facilities. And um, I think that the idea of using the old garage is a good idea. Um, I'd like to know more about it. I'd like to understand the budget better. Um, and the spatial arrangements and how it's going to fit on the site and all that sort of thing. Um, and I'm also concerned about raising the money for it and what money is not raised um, has to go on the debt of the town. So it's a big deal. Um, and uh, related to that then is um, the fire department and how the fire department is organized and, and where we're going there. And um, I don't know whether you remember, but in 2011, uh, Kramer and Associates did a study for the fire department. And in that study, um, they recommended uh, or supported the consolidation idea that has been going forward of having all of the fire equipment in one place. But then they also recommended another firehouse 10 years out. And um, as you've already mentioned, the uh, fire engine down at the university um, it's, I think, been pretty clear that the university would like to have a firehouse in their environs. So um, I think that's something that should be out on the table and understood by the public as we discuss what should happen to um, Mercer Company number three <coughs> and uh, whether some things that might be considered for that location could in fact go at a new firehouse um, near the campus. So the whole situation really should be under consideration, and I would hope that you would include that in your feasibility considerations. And there's another idea, too, that you should consider, I think, um, and of course, we've just been through consolidation, and we're all experienced with this, and uh, the concept of consolidation is that you um, are able to maintain the same services, but you're able to save some money. Uh, and uh, the fire department, of course, was already consolidated between the borough and the township. But there's also another concept of consolidating it with the other uh, communities around us. And, um, you know, we have fires on the edge of our community, and we have our firehouse in more or less the center. I'm not sure how geographical that is, but let's say it's the center. Uh, and there may be times in which um, fire companies from another town might be able to take care of the fire and get there sooner than, than we can. And in fact, what happens is, is that the volunteers who are great guys and, and gals, and I'd like to see more gals in the fire department, uh, turn out whenever there's a fire. And so uh, for a small fire, uh, we still have quite a few fire companies turning up. For instance, uh, last year there was a fire, a uh, house fire on, uh, in the, um, uh, Cherry Valley area and seven fire companies, not including ours, I think was eight altogether, turned up for that. Montgomery, Rocky Hill, uh, Plasma Physics Lab, uh, East, uh, West Windsor, you know, everybody came because there was an alarm and everybody came. But is that really the best way to, to run a fire operation? Maybe if we had um, some consolidation, uh, there would be more of a hierarchy and maybe there would be more of a clarity as to which fire engines should go uh, when. And uh, because right now, it seems like we have such great volunteers, they all turn out, which is wonderful. But we're using fire equipment in doing that. And it might be that if we had a consolidated fire department that included our uh, neighboring, or maybe a couple, or maybe all of our neighboring communities. In fact, there are considerations of uh, county-wide fire departments going on now. Uh, Governor Christie's been encourage encouraging um, a number of counties to look at this idea. Uh, but that might save a lot of equipment, and I know that each fire department feels that they should have the full array of fire equipment, and you all know how expensive fire equipment is. So possibly if there was some consolidation, we might be able to do with a little less fire equipment, which would mean uh, also we would have uh, the need for less firehouse space, and that would save quite a bit of money, and it might actually, in fact, be more efficient and get to the fire faster. And also, as you well know, we have an issue with volunteers in our community. And uh, one of our problems is, is that um, uh, we are uh, sort of tilting towards the, the wealthy side of our community. And a lot of people uh, who uh, would be, like to volunteer to be firemen aren't, or firewomen are not necessarily those folks. 
And so, uh, but again, if you went into more of a regional environment, there might be people from Rocky Hill or Montgomery or the Windsors or something, Lawrenceville, who would be more apt to volunteer, and maybe we would have a better situation there. So I'm just suggesting that you really look at this. Um, my brother was a volunteer for the fire, for the rescue squad for eons, and um, as a high school kid, I think he was the youngest kid on the squad, and he'll never forget that um, experience. And uh, so the, the rescue squad has always been near, to, near and dear to us, and the fire department is something that's very special also. And um, I'm just suggesting that you think outside the box, and, and uh, that let's think a little more deeply, and let's be clear, too, about what the university's aspirations are and get them all on the table so we know everything that's going on all at once. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Next on the agenda is presentation of financial policies. Uh, Scott Sullivan, chair of the Citizens Finance Advisory Committee, and it looks like you brought some help with you tonight. Reinforcements. <laughs> Bob? There we go. Thank you. All right. Evening. Um, we, we just want to basically run through very quickly a summarization of how the budget compares with our, the policies that have been, uh, been established by Council with respect to financial matters. Um, in particular, in particular, the uh, the three policies are number one, the surplus policy, and that and the summary of the policies basically there is that that will establish the budget that in a manner that uh, that projected sur available surplus at the end of the, of the fiscal years within the target range that's been established. That the surplus projection will be presented to council for review as part of the budget to make sure we're headed in the right direction. And the target range is 15 to 20 percent of uh, available surplus is 15 to 20 percent of budgeted appropriations. Um, second, capital policy summary: that uh, capital spending will be planned consistent with the debt policy, which I'll get to in a moment, and that the administration is responsible for annually developing a six-year cap capital plan for review and approval by council, which you guys did a couple of meetings ago. And then lastly, the debt policy, the capital spending plan, which is the source of all our debt, uh, is, uh, is managed so that projected debt service will, uh, on, in, within the general budget, will, uh, general debt will uh, rise by no more than 1.5% per annum, uh, taking into account that we can use some uh, capital surplus to uh, offset debt service uh, to get us over our temporary hump. That, that the uh, basic leverage of current fund debt is less than 180% of uh, budgeted revenues, and that enterprise-wide debt, which includes the utilities, uh, is less than 200% of, uh, of enterprise-wide uh, uh, revenues. And uh, going right into how we stack up on those, um, the first is the current fund surplus projection. Uh, let me back up by saying, as we know, budgets don't reflect what we really think will happen uh, during the fiscal year. Uh, for that reason, we need a rigorous projection. There are things that are in the budget that, that, that are not in the budget that, that then uh, occur as revenues. There are some, some very, very conservative estimates made on budgeted expenditures that we know we're going to underspend that will give rise to revenues in the, in the subsequent fiscal year that will make the budget and the actual results differ substantially. Um, having said that, just going to the, the, the punchline here, we're projecting that the change in surplus for the 2014 year will be virtually nil, that is, uh, that 
line in, on the projected column in 2014 of a change of $82,000 in surplus. It's basically flat, giving uh, rise to uh, a an available surplus as a percent of budgeted revenues at the start of the year of 17.2 percent, and it ought to be this, at the same level for 2015. Um, how we get there isn't very transparent. Uh, I'll, I'll just point out that we have um, one one million four hundred sixty thousand dollars. That number right there of budgeted OE appropriations that are above and beyond what we spent for everyday mundane items over what we actually spent in 2013. Uh, so that's an example of how we are very, very conservative in our budget. Unfortunately, from our point of view, it's, it gives rise to a very, very difficult analysis that has to be done to figure out what's going on in the budget. And it, it gives rise to a certain lack of transparency in the budget process, in the budget. Can I, can I jump in here and ask, do you, are you saying, I mean, can you expand on that a little bit to explain it? I mean, it sounds like what, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is we have an, uh, we, we, we put in a big cushion and then we spend that cushion, but we don't really know how it was spent. No, we don't spend the cushion. In 2013, we, thought that we were going to be flat on our budget, and we underspent it by $2.7 million. Um, we're very good on, on not spending the money. Okay. We're just bad on forecasting what we're going to spend. Okay. So what's not transparent? I mean... Well, well it, when, it gets to, when, it, when it gets to be crunch time, when there are really real spending decisions that have to be made, it's very difficult to tell what your real spending is. Um, in past years, we have made tax why, why is it difficult to tell where the spending is? Because we never close out, uh, we, we, we don't close out actual spending until after we have already struck the subsequent year's budget. 2013 Okay, spending. so so we don't really, we haven't closed out two, 2000, we 2013's did, man, yet. But, but we our just budgets, did. Our budgets are established over, off of prior year budgets, right. not prior year spending. Right, right. So when do you actually see what you've actually spent? Right. And how do you know what you spent when nobody's looking at it? Right. So it's, it's not a transparent process. There's better ways to do it. But bottom line, this time, we think that we're going to be fairly stable uh, uh, going forward, with that revenues are going to equal appropriations going forward for the, at, at, at current levels. Um, the impact of the capital plan on debt service. This is the same chart that we showed you at our capital and debt policy meeting uh, uh, a month or two ago. Uh, the capital plan hasn't changed since that time, and so it's still uh, uh, valid. And as I said before, in, at that meeting, the red trend line is what we project our debt service to be, to be based on uh, excuse me, the, the, the red trend line is, is what our debt service would be if it increased by 1.5% per year going forward. The green line is what our capital plan has our spending uh, increase, a capital, a debt service increasing by in the next five years. Um, as you can see, for 2004, our debt service is going to be flat. Uh, beyond that, it starts to spike up a little. Uh, and that is where we're going to apply 1.4 million of our 3.4 million capital surplus to offset that growth in debt service in, in the interim period so we stay within that trend line. And then lastly, the projected debt ratios, these are a little preliminary, but uh, they have us, since debt isn't changing by much uh, this year, our our leverage ratios are staying within the policy limits at 160 percent, roughly, of, of revenues. Um, just as far as, our, as, as the areas of CFAC focus, uh, first, the budget is, as a result of our analysis, consistent with the, with the Council's policy, policies. Uh, as I said before, generally, we spend a lot less than we budget. Um, 
and the way we provide our cushion cushion in our budget makes it very difficult to know where the spending trends are and we could reduce our budget materially without uh, impacting any spending and make it a little bit more material make it a little bit more transparent this all doesn't affect real tax dollars it doesn't change taxes it doesn't change real spending it just makes it clear what's going on well is part of the reason that th this might be hard is because of consolidate this is the first year of consolidation I mean or the so second this has year. been the, the standard practice in both municipalities for for uh, no I understand that but I, I'm just wondering why, why how that's going yeah to yeah I think well uh, we've recommended it and uh, I think as it's just as far as you know the the budget timeline uh, there wasn't an opportunity to really uh, change the practice so are we thinking about changing it there, there, there are a couple things I think you can do one of the, the New Jersey budget law is flawed in, the, in the fact that you know you get halfway through the year before you adopt the budget. I know. I've always you wondered get why that was. a quarter was. of the way year, through the year, and you're still spending last year's money, which is what Scott's alluding to there. I think what you know as we get into this and we can produce harder numbers earlier. And I know Sandy did a couple of um, uh, quarterly reports last year that showed you where your spending was tracking. That kind of information is helpful when you're starting to put a budget together. Although it's not going to be finalized, it's still going to be good numbers. And what, what Scott's referring to is when you look at those three columns, you know, that we put together for you, the number that you're seeing as expended money is probably a December number that probably really only goes through October, November in many cases because how long it takes to get things posted. So you're dealing with, with some stale information. So typically we do budget off of what our budgeted funds were in a previous year um, you know it's it and it is not it's not the most accurate way of doing it but it is conservative um, and both towns have usually been fairly conservative with budgets because you always have surprises thrown at you in the middle of the year and you know tradition has always said that you know it's, it's difficult to say no in a lot of cases with some of those surprises um, so that has um, well, this is an area of debate it's because, it's it's because it's the question isn't should we budget for contingencies? Yes, we should. It's where do you put that contingent budget? You know, we've got we've got a, a very large up to cap amount that sits within the the the, the council's budget. We've got a very large uh, reserve fund collected taxes, and then scattered throughout every single line item are our cushions. To Bob's point, you know the New Jersey. Uh, uh, statutes require that you get, stipulate that you can't spend money unless it's budgeted for so every time you have a modest overrun suddenly everybody's scrambling around transferring things around which you can't do until the end of the year until November anyhow um, and the, the law requires the budget to be based on last year's too doesn't it no. No. so, there, so are, there, yeah there are problems with revenue projections that you can't you, you know, can't budget more revenue additional revenue if you didn't oh, raise okay. it in a prior year okay. unless you that's have a I contract okay. that's going to clearly right. illustrate you'll get it etc um scott you mentioned revising um our approach is that revising our approach um with the understanding of our restrictions with the state budgeting laws or no 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 okay no there's a there are other towns out there that that budget based on actual they 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 then have a, a very uh, robust discussion with, with with their elected officials over what's changed they agree to that budget and then when that's all done then they turn around and within the state document they then throw all the all the cushions back within all the line items to make it consistent with state law but when council looks at a budget when administration looks at a budget they're not relying on the on the state document they're relying on what is really going on within the government within the administration and the municipality uh, that would make it a little bit clearer and then you wouldn't have to appropriate 5.8 million dollars of surplus every year you could probably cut that dramatically and reduce the size of the, size of the surplus you needed to maintain Use it for other things. 
So that's that's an area of, fu for, uh, of future focus. You know, I I, I don't want to I, I don't want to give you the impression that they haven't done a great job um, uh, of putting a budget together that is that is uh, very responsive to everybody's concerns. It's just that there's opportunity for us to improve how we've done things over past practices in the future. Um, the other focus area is this is the last slide, so we're almost done for the evening. One, obviously, the budget process did not conform with the budget policy calendar that we adopted uh, uh, late last year. There's a lot of ins and outs as to why. Uh, um, you know we are where we are now, and you know we'll, I'm sure we'll continue to improve upon that. You know, third, second year consolidation, we've still got some learning curves. They put they finally consolidated their information system, so you know now I think they that we're on a better footing. And then lastly, and this is where I've got my army up here with me, is basically when we get back to our biggest line item and our, our the biggest discussions we've been having over the last couple of months is over capital spending and borrowing and are, are we spending enough money should we be dedicating should we be borrowing more and in, 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 in the face of future tax increases should we be dedicating more revenue directly to capital spending instead of borrowing it uh, should we uh, recommend a modest increase in the municipal tax to do so if, you know if you spend a you know Two percent is seven hundred thousand dollars. Is that ad infinitum? Is that enough money to satisfy a capital the the capital spending needs that everybody appears to be stating that they have? Um, should we be borrowing money for things like you know computers, iPads, soccer goalposts? Uh, or should we have a more disciplined approach where we're just budgeting for real capital items and, and expensing the rest of the stuff as we go along? You know, and, and in that category, should we be borrowing for road maintenance even? It's given that we know we're going to spend that much money every year, and you know, once you start borrowing for things that are more or less current items, you start putting yourselves in a slippery slope. We're, you know getting, we're weaning out of that right now by, by eliminating the salaries uh, uh, budgeting for salaries, which was about 400,000, I think, increase in our current budget this year, but it's going to be at a benefit to all future years and lower debt service. Um, you know, the road, the road maintenance idea sounds radical, but it also really sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Do any other towns do that? Yeah. Most, many AAA communities do, but they're not... You know, we're a different town, as as people say. Most AAA communities and AA communities are are rural, are suburban, rich suburbs, wealthy suburbs. They're not Princeton, which is not really that wealthy, uh, and you know has an older downtown and uh, and a lot of beat up roads and, and and infrastructure that have been around for ages. So, you know, there's there's explanations as to why, but you know. You mean the other roads, the other, the newer communities? If you look at places like West Windsor, expensive. West Windsor, you know, they're, 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 yeah. you know. So do they have, does West Windsor do it this way? Um, you know, I use them just as an example. Okay, but okay, the, I just wondered. The, the one that, that doesn't is, uh, um. It doesn't matter. I, I, that's no, not. No, Bernard's. Bernard's. Bernard's, yeah. Bernard's Township, I think it is, or Bernard'sville, one of the two. They, they expense everything right through. You know, they, they, they don't have the right, but it does make a lot of sense if that if you're spending. I mean, I've heard the engineering department talk about how they have a very predictable plan for maintenance, and so we know how much we're going to spend every year. So it really but it does issue, make sense. But the, it isn't the issue that we can't get from zero to sixty in yeah. two seconds, right? I mean, we just yeah, Brian, yeah, you yeah, you want to come in. The question that's is correct. And, and what, you know, what would be an a path to get there? An yeah, on yeah, the other exactly. side is, is that that benefits all future taxpayers. So you know, why should the why should this taxpayer be footing the whole bill? Right. Uh, but you know, you can make that argument forever, and uh, right, and wind maybe up there's like a federal a government process. Right. I guess that would be great. Is there a recommendation for phasing that in? To well, get and, then, and then lastly, and then I'll let my my colleagues jump in here for a second. Is you know, are we reasonably and adequately maintaining our assets? You know, I know that every department head up here will come up and say no, just because that's 
what they're trained to say, but the question is, you know, I, I do not think, our impression is that there hasn't been a real, real kind of step back assessment done of, of what would it take to adequately maintain on a regular schedule, uh, year in, year out basis. You know, it's, it, it would be better to, to replace the pump station a year before it breaks down, then to hire you know, the emergency to crew, crew to come in on uh, on Christmas Eve to replace it, for example, if you could be th be that precise in your prediction. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Brian here, or Gary, for a minute. Um, uh, thanks. So I just wanted to reinforce a few things, um, Scott said, and I'll, I'll try not to be too repetitive, although some of the notes I have will um, cause me to repeat things. Um, one point I just want to make is, as we try to get our arms around the capital um, spending, it is not easy to separate that from the present day. So as you consider a current operating budget, um, for example, just to highlight the difference between no tax increase and a 2% increase is about 700,000 spendable dollars. So if you believe that either we're not maintaining a sufficient level or there are other things you would like to do, while that is just a fraction of the amount that would be needed to do it, if you want to do something, you have to start somewhere. Um, so let me just make a few points. Um, the uh, first is that as long as we treat, treat our roads, curbs, and sidewalks, as uh, discrete individual projects to be financed on a 20-year cycle. Um, I don't believe, and I think many members of the uh, committee don't believe, that we really know whether the current amount of spending is sufficient. Um, earlier tonight, when engineering was sitting here, they told you that about $4 million a year was borrowed to maintain um, you know, those components of our infrastructure and suggested that it wasn't enough. And if I heard Bob correctly, he's, he wondered whether it might be $6 million. So that's not just a difference of $2 million. Um, that's a difference of $40 million over the 20 years. So that's a $40 million imbalance um, if we're off by $2 million a year. So it's really important to figure that out as soon as possible. And that has an impact on our current operating budget in terms of you know what how what we um how we pay for capital which we do not need to always borrow for well uh, excuse me wouldn't that be really difficult to do with say sidewalks because i f i feel like you could say i'm going to maintain them so that there's no there are no cracks <laughs> or we're going to maintain them so there's some cracks <laughs> it, it, it's it's not easy but it it it's some level level there's a a theoretical level over 20 years that would be an appropriate rate of renewal. Um, on some streets, a tree is going to come down and require um, rebuilding at a, a faster rate. Um, somewhere else, you know, it may be less fast. But there's, you know, there are, we as a community should be able to figure out what is close to an appropriate rate for the um, regular maintenance, the periodic major maintenance, and then the every 15 to 25 year major resurfacing, rebuilding, reconstruction um, that is needed to maintain um, you know, the infrastructure of roads, curbs, and sidewalks. Um, uh, uh, so one risk is that we're not funding these at a current level. A second risk is that we have had remarkably favorable interest rates for close to a decade now. And no one thinks that this will last or recommends that we should presume that today's rates will be the same rates that we have over the next five and 10 years. So one thing we haven't had a chance to do is um, an interest rate sensitivity analysis. If interest rates were to go up just by two percentage points, not, not just, that would be a meaningful jump, um, but one well within the realm of the possible and were to persist for many years, it could have one of two effects despite the other excellent um, uh, rules and principles that are now in place to make sure our debt is maintained at manageable levels. If the cost of that debt were to go up, either it's going to make the wedge in the operating budget a bigger one 
even though we're not actually borrowing anymore and put pressure on other spending, or it's going to re mean that we have to constrain our spending and possibly maintain key parts of our infrastructure at an even slower rate than we're currently doing this. So I would just note that that's a risk that we don't fully understand right now. Um, two philosophical issues um, I'd just like to mention. If you believe that consolidation is an opportunity to rethink the way that we do some things, um, the first I would note, which Scott has already mentioned, is that in our capital plan, we capitalize relatively short-lived items that are very different from items like the library, the pool, the municipal buildings, a firehouse that we think might last for you know, 20 to you know, 50 years. Um, as Scott mentioned, there are iPads, there are soccer goals, there are uh, PCs, there are things that at, while we're conforming with state law, we are bonding for things that from a capital perspective have very short lives. Um, and so is this a time, if we're thinking differently, to look at that and really try to have a capital plan that looks at capital items that have lives that are 10 years or longer? Um, the second, and again, this is the one that Scott highlighted, um, many of our peer AAA municipalities view uh, the major components of infrastructure as interconnected systems that require ongoing basic maintenance, major maintenance, and the resurfacing and, and rebuilding, and they pay for that out of their operating budget. Um, we can't do that. We're, we're, we can't do that right away, but if we want to think about it, we have to think about starting to do some of that. Um, and the longer we wait, the harder it makes it to do that. Um, uh, when we borrow, uh, and this is just a note, um, I, I presume everybody knows that financing has costs, even in low interest rate environments. Um, every year we pay significant sums to financial advisors, lawyers, and investment banks for our borrowing and refinancing needs. Um, less reliance on debt, less fees to those professional service providers, um, who I would note from what we see have served this community well. Um, in providing good service and good advice. Um, finally, uh, you know, just two um, notes that uh, the combined municipalities over the last four years, um, if I'm recalling correctly, held taxes flat for three years and then reduced them. Um, and that effect is to have, in one way, if it had been 2% per year increases, we foregone almost 10% in tax increases, which would represent three and a half million dollars of revenue. Well, that would take us maybe halfway um, to moving out of the debt super cycle in funding you know, some of our uh, core infrastructure needs and put us on the right path. It, it's what we did. It was the right thing to do. Um, and, and even at 10%, we would have been well below the schools and well below the county over that period of time. That $3.5 million, I think, represents sort of the outside of what we hope might be possible through savings from consolidation net of the addition of the cost of new services. So we're right, you know, even if you believe that every penny of savings should go back to the taxpayers, there's one way of looking at this that would suggest we have accomplished that. And now it's important for us to really think about the future and make sure that if we plan on having a robust infrastructure and robust services, that um, where we're having more vehicle miles on roads, more visitors to the town, uh, more storms, um, we just need to be you know, having an operating budget and taxes that reflect the costs, not just as we see them today, but as they will continue to grow in the future. Um, so uh, that, that's all I'll say, you know, which is not to make you even more greatly concerned about capital, which I know you are, um, but just to say that as you're looking at an operating budget, um, you know, there's a cost to not doing some things now. Um, and if you don't consider modestly raising the taxes, you know, there may come a time down the road when your successors feel greatly constrained 
um, because of that. Can I ask a quick question? So uh, several times we've heard that uh, sh items that are well within the legal limit but probably have shorter lifespans than the 20 years that they've been um, bonded for. What percent of the of our obligation do you think that is, the, these things that are short term? Because, I mean, we talked about taking the salaries out, and it's $400,000 roughly. As a percent of our obligation, it isn't really so yeah, it's much. Not, it's, I, it would be, uh, I haven't scrubbed the numbers, but I believe it would be on that order of magnitude uh, in the low hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to uh, find a way to put everything with uh, a 10 year life or less you know into the operating yeah budget. not so much it's it's not it, it's it's achievable yeah. um, it's not insurmountable but it, it's not a tiny rounding error that wouldn't be noticed you know it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range thank you can I Okay. So in, in the um, ideal financing, you know, where we stop um, um, doing um, maintenance under the capital budget, let's just say that we decided we wanted to do that over 20 years. What would be the first, I mean, or do you, in your mind, do you have a plan that if, if you could rule the world, you would, how would you achieve that? Uh, well, if I could rule the world, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't have a plan. I just, I, I just, or a uh, suggestion. Think, well, it, it costs money, right? Because we're we're kind of used to the status quo. So to stop, when but you it costs money in the short term. Yes, um, but in, in, doesn't it? If you look at over a twenty or thirty year period. Um, it should save money because we would be eliminating certain costs that we currently incur. And it saves even more money if interest rates go up, it, uh, wouldn't it? it? Yes, but that has to be balanced with the fact that you, it would be extremely difficult to do this over a short period of time. So we'd have to work with the staff to um, run some calculations, I think, to understand what it would take over uh, 20 years if you wanted to do that. It would not be like a simple little bit. It, it would require yeah. some very significant and concerted work over that time frame. Well, so do you consider it virtually impossible? Uh, no, it's not easy. Um, but there, there, you you have to make hard choices. You, all are the you time. talking about, ra like, for instance, raising taxes? Not, yeah, somewhat raising taxes, but also who will who will take the burden of it versus who gets the benefits of it. You know, your, you, you, you know, your current residents would have to pay more in taxes versus, you know, future residents. Well, that's assuming we do it with a tax increase. R right. So, right, so there, it, it's very challenging to think this through because um, if you believe that we're spending at exactly the perfect rate right now, we're renewing at exactly the perfect rate, then there would be a cost for future, for current residents, that would be slightly greater than what the future residents might be paying. They would benefit from this discipline. On the other hand, if you're trying to get the intergenerational balance right, if you are underspending on capital items now, you are pushing those expenses to future residents. So that's the first thing, as Scott said, that we really need to understand is, is the rate of capital expenditures adequate? And if it's not, that would probably the, be the first place you'd want to look with any additional revenue is to make sure you're not increasing, you know, a, a kind of invisible deficit of deferred maintenance. Um, and then if you were comfortable that you had that in steady state, then you could ask the question of what could we do to begin um, reversing something that we started many decades ago and is unfair to think that any current resident or current elected official should have to uh, you know solve overnight um, who, who does um, what you're mentioning um, it's like a I don't know a 
comprehensive financial I don't know data. I don't know plan or something. But who who do, who would do that? Like within our within our uh, administrator and CFO and like who who would put something like that together? I mean that's like thinking outside the box and putting this. Like where would that come from? Well, well uh, um, there are two different things. One is what's the process of assessing whether our rate of uh, maintenance and renewal of our capital. Um, plant is sufficient. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know who would do that. I, I presume it would be um, that our staff has some of that capability, but there are probably consultants that do this who could provide an, a good set of eyes and benchmarking to other um, communities to tell you if you have X miles of roads, X miles of sidewalks, and X types of cars and buses and trucks going through uh, with certain volumes, you should think about this rate. Um, the second thing is a question of uh, what would it take to begin uh, paying for more of our capital expenses out of our current operating funds. And that's something that the staff and the finance advisory committee and the existing advisors could, could do. Thank you. Gary, do you have an opinion? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think you've, you've presented a very interesting and challenging concept. Because if I think about road maintenance, if I recall the numbers correctly, the borough spent about 2 to $3 million a year on road maintenance and the township spent about twice that. And we're now spending about, so two to three million, let's say two million plus four million, six million, and we're now spending about four million, which says, says to me that we're deferring maintenance on the roads. And then the question becomes, where else? Are we deferring maintenance? And it strikes me that if you separate out things that have relatively short lives, like computers and, and iPads and, and cell phones, uh, where you replace them in, in two, three, or five year cycles, most of the, the maintenance that we have to do, most of the equipment that we have to replace, including roads, have a fairly well-defined life. Uh, air conditioning units, chillers, pumps, um, all have life expectancies that are pretty well understood and, and uh, from, from statistics. And you may get fooled uh, in that sometimes a pump fails earlier than you would expect it to fail, and sometimes it lasts a hell of a long, lot longer than you would expect it to last. But it seems to me that the, systematically it if we had the resources to do it, either internally or through a consultant, we could go through the um, capital, what, what you would define as capital maintenance items, uh, items that are going to last 10 or more years, uh, like big, big pieces, big elements of buildings, the, the buildings that we own, and understand what the replacement is going to, what the replacement is going to be. At, over time, it, it's a massive uh, job to do it. And uh, yes, it's a very big job. And um, in addition to taking into account what we currently know and what our current experience is, it requires a certain bit of thinking about the future. So the transit um, group that's been meeting is forecasting a significant increase in vehicles um, in our community. Well, um, if we maintain our roads on a 20-year cycle and you increase uh, vehicle miles by 50 percent and then overlay that with um, what recently has seemed to be more challenging weather patterns where we've had three 20-year storms in five years, um, those would affect your projections also. 
um, in terms of funding with the sewer system, you theoretically through separate fees have an opportunity to set those at an appropriate level. Um, short of fencing the Princeton's with uh, tolls, it's, it's a bit harder to think of how to do that with some other components of the infrastructure. Any other questions or comments from uh, members of council? I do have a question. You know, talking about the surplus, the projections from the uh, Consolidation Commission, the Transition Task Force, were that we would have about $3 million in the third year, about $3 million per year um, in savings. Um, and so as we're in year two, is that projection still reasonable, achievable? Is that where we're going to go? Well, we, we didn't go back and kind of grind it to the nth degree, but just eyeballing it, yes, we're, we're there. The only, you know, I think portion where maybe they, they were a little bit optimistic was just in the, uh, in the uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the salary levelization, up, the harmonization. The harmonization was really painful. Of that we're off a little bit there, but then the other issue. We're also ahead in the. Right, and the police department in the. In We're the ahead this year. Next year will be the telling year because a lot was was predicated upon retirements and so forth, and and whether or not those actually become all reality. But the idea is, at some point, we're going to get there, whether it's fully next year or the year after. At some point, people are going to retire, so you're going to get there. Yeah, I, you know, my my gut is we're in we're in pretty good shape on it, and I got to believe that, particularly when you look at the OE numbers, that there's going to be continuing opportunity to to find areas small dollars but you know many many little pockets of small dollars going forward right so and elsewhere uh, I guess just as I think about this and the suggestion that possibly you know needing more investment in infrastructure I feel like I've heard Bob say and also Kathy say that they expect there's still more savings that haven't maybe not fully identified but kind of people have ideas about where we might find additional savings. And I guess I'm wondering to what extent that's been accounted for in our budget. And even in, even the retirements, I mean, did you, is there a guesstimate at some of that and included in the budget or is Absolutely this? Absolutely not, not the way we put our budgets together. N there's not been any um, estimate that you, we think there will be retirements and no we we'll just assume that everybody is going to stay on as is and, unless they have already announced it or already done something then no there's, then no. there's nothing so it's, they're, it's they're possible funded. if some of that does come to fruition we would end up with surplus more surplus than we're anticipating as far as the budget you're numbers you're talking go. about very very minor dollars I think I mean, with, with every retirement or every individual that leaves for whatever reason, those positions are reevaluated. That's where some of the savings came from last year. If you listen to engineering and, um, you know, the amount of people that we've, you know, modified there, we're looking at starting up that uh, click it program, but we're going to use existing staffing somewhere in the building to do it. That means somebody else is going to, you know, lose a body. So we, we reevaluate the staffing needs at every opportunity that we have that. Um, you know, it's some of the other areas that we that we looked at in the beginning was the way we restructured how we clean the buildings, and the bid documents that were utilized because the township bid most of that out. The borough had in-house staff. We kind of combined those two things, got a you know min minimal savings, but it was uh, I don't know twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars by combining that and reducing and changing the bid specs around to to make it a little more cost effective so there are ways that we're going to continue to save that staff does that all the time anyway um, you know so but they're small items in a 60 million dollar budget you have to get a lot of thirty thousand dollar items to you know make it feel good on the outside I'll tell you one place where there's a pocket of money it would be very very confident controversial to start looking at it, but that's in our, uh, our real estate assets we got a lot of a lot of under underutilized real, real estate, uh, particularly as we, you know, move the public works facility out to River Road. 
I just want to make sure that the public doesn't um, doesn't leave here tonight thinking that we budget um, that we bond for um, uh, items with um, with a life, short lifespan, uh, such as you mentioned, iPads or soccer balls or goal goalposts. I mean, that's I think that may have been included in a budget, but I mean, I think today that we're very this council is very realistic when it comes to uh, bonding, and I think that we look twice at those kind of things. Um, so I just want even your report's fine, and it's good to get those that kind of news. And it's good to look at restructuring, but it's also, um, you know, I guess to note that we're, as you mentioned, that we're doing a fine job, um, and we could do better. I, I agree with you 100%. We've got a AAA rating. We haven't raised the taxes in years. We must be doing a couple things right. And the way we keep on doing them right is by keep on challenging ourselves, right? And the group up here. Uh, and your two colleagues who are not here have, in a relatively short time, put in place a number of very important financial controls that um, may not be fully appreciated um, by citizens for some time, but are very significant and do an awful lot to uh, give uh, the committee great comfort that there are steps that have been taken that are very prudent ones and ones in the best interests of both the current and the future residents. Just, just to respond to your comments, Scott, about the assets and monetizing our assets, that's really a one-shot solution. It's, it's not a solution to the problem in the long run. And I think if, if we're going to have a solution to the problem in the long run, we, we've got to have a, a better, much better understanding of what our replacement and maintenance policy is and uh, plan to do maintenance and replacement on a systematic basis, the way the big boys do. <laughs> All right. Uh, With that, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, public comment. Yes. Ms. Cherry. Before our great community disappears, um, I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, this concept of seed money, and um, I'm worried about that idea. Um, and I've, I've seen us kind of start down that track. Um, the cold storage facility, for instance, where we've already um, had in our budget some money for engineering and such, uh, land survey, before the community really had, I think, committed to the project. I'm not saying it's not a good project, and I certainly see that there are savings to getting our equipment out of the rain, but um, I think that the community needs to have a discussion about our priorities, and we shouldn't be sort of inching into it before the community has a chance to say, oh, well, um, you know, we think PFARs is more important than cold storage, and if we can't do both of them at the same time, then, or whatever they're going to say. But I mean, I think that the community needs to have essentially a capital budget and an idea to, to weigh in and, and give you guys guidance as to what the community wants, uh, because they're going to pay for this. And um, PFARs, um, I think the uh, estimate was something like six and a half million dollars. And it's not even clear to me where any of the money is going to come from. Um, the estimate for the land um, may or may not be right on. And I think they plan to raise $2 million, which is quite a bit since they haven't been raising very much um, in terms of donations, um, et cetera. So I mean, even that little, that one project has got a lot of pieces to it. And um, so, uh, but if you start spending money here and there, and in committing us to projects before we really decided we want to do a project. Um, and I'm a little concerned too about the feasibility study on the firehouse that way. I mean, I understand we need to do a feasibility of some sort, but um, now the number that I had seen in the newspaper in the packet was um, $280,000. Is that what you're planning to spend uh, for the firehouse feasibility at this point? That would be for preliminary design, whatever it led into. It's 10% of the original estimated project cost. So that well, it could be a it could be a bunch of 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 different parts. 
Well, I, I would say it's a little early to get too far into, fees into a preliminary design. I mean, I could see maybe concept or something, but as I said, I think that there are some big issues to be discussed regarding a second firehouse and whether some of the things that were thought needed to be here maybe could be at the second firehouse. And um, of course, I'm very concerned still about Dolly Road School. I see it as an asset that's been uh, drummed into the ground and I'd still like to see it saved. I'm not saying that it's uh, the responsibility of the town, although the town did have a part in all this, uh, the school board. Uh, but there's a good example of an asset that we've just kind of, you know, if I can use the vernacular, pissed away. So, <laughs> um, and I also want to make uh, one more comment too. Uh, we're not Burnettsville. Uh, we are a diverse community and we are trying like heck to keep it that way. And um, it's very hard. And we've had people who moved out during the previous uh, assessment, people who couldn't pay their taxes when their property was reassessed. And um, uh, you don't have any influence over the assessment, but you do have an influence over the tax rate and the ultimate tax that people pay. If we want to keep it a diversified town, we've got to keep the costs under control for the taxpayers. Now, the municipality is the only piece of that. We all know that. We've got the county, we've got the school board, and the school board is something like 48%. Um, there was an idea knocking around about a recreation facility. I, I have a feeling that meant in lieu of Valley Road School, but on that site for seniors and youths, I, you know, I don't know whether we need anything like that. And what about our school assets? Can't we use those? Um, the school board um, has, uh, you know, taken the view that they need to um, have large fees whenever anybody wants to use a school facility. So generally they don't. They use the library or some other room or something. But there are assets there that we all paid for. And, um, you know, but for a custodian at night or something, people could use those things. But the fees are very high. And so people who want to do dance, who, you know, theater, any number of things that could be in a school facility can't get in there to do it. So, you know, we're all in the same boat together. The schools are not uh, independent in that way. They, they all are <laughs> taking money out of the same pocket. And I, I would personally like to see a lot more discussion with the school board about how we could uh, get shared services going with them uh, in terms of the assets that we have. And uh, I think that, you know, this is a neat opportunity, but we could turn the wrong way. And um, if we really want to maintain our community as a community that's diverse for Latinos and African Americans and all the people that have been part of creating this town, uh, we have to keep you know, keep on that trail and we can't, uh, you know, go off that trail. And when you talk about, well, we could raise taxes just a little bit and we could get 700,000 or, you know, any, you know, each of those things that's coming out of a pocket of somebody and, and every, you know, those somebodies are paying more taxes every year, all, you know, total taxes. And every year they're deciding whether they can stay in our town or whether they need to move out. So, um, you know, I, I, I know you all know all this stuff, but I, I'm just saying, please keep it in mind because this is what makes us special. This is why we're not Burnsville. We are a special one-of-a-kind town, and we want to keep it that way. And uh, it's going to take some uh, real finesse to do it, but let's, you know, we love our town. Let's, let's do it. Let's keep it going the way, you know, we have been keeping it going and, and, uh, and, and not try to be something that we, that we haven't been in the past and that we really don't want to be. So um, that's my plea. And um, please keep your eye on Valley Road School. I, you know, I just, it's an old building that I think is part of our fabric and I, I hope you won't forget it. And uh, I also want to make a comment about the, the firehouse. It's not holding up very well. And that's another thing that I think you all need to be cognizant of. When you build something, it's got to be built well. You know, Princeton University has something like a 90 year life for their buildings. Uh, they spend a lot of money getting there. But, um, you know, I've, I've stood in Valley Road School watching brickwork being done. That, there shouldn't be brickwork work that needs to be done in that firehouse. It's not that old. Uh, so um, I, I'm just very concerned about the quality of the work that we get, too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kip. Any other comments from the public? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.